Good morning and welcome to another episode of the Cardio Seeds podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Svetlana Shimon. I'm a CEO of Cardio Seeds and our company delivers solutions to advance wellness of healthcare professionals and lifestyle medicine. And during this holiday season, we prepared an excellent gift for you guys. This is my new book, Resilience in Scrubs, Thriving as a Woman healthcare professional or woman resident physician rather there are several iterations of this book now it's available on amazon amazon prime and amazon kindle also so you can upload it or download it whatever you want to do with that the book is packed with valuable information carefully selected resources and toolkits on gender dynamics and medicine resilience and wellness salary negotiations family integration embracing leadership roles exploring career pivots personal wellness and much much more so it can make a great gift during holiday season to all your family members friends your doctors and everybody who is in medicine women in medicine so i really appreciate it and here's a catch all the proceeds from this book sales will go back to the american college of lifestyle medicine i pledge to support 100 new female or any residence memberships for the upcoming year 2024 so please support me we cannot do it without you and thank you with that we'll get started and today i hope to have a tremendous um podcast episode because we have an excellent amazing guest today michael stack is with us today and michael stack is an embodiment of wellness and health and healthy lifestyle. Michael is a faculty lecturer at the University of Michigan School of Kinesiology, and he is a creator and host of the Wellness Paradox um, a podcast that I was privileged to be <laughs> on one of those days. Michael is also a is a founder and the CEO of a venture a applied fitness solutions that I'm going to ask him about. And he is a um, the owner uh, of frontline fitness pros. And I am going to put his bio uh, under the description of the podcast today. Um, and with no further delays, Michael, welcome to this episode of the Cardio Seeds podcast. I'm very honored to have you today. And I have a ton of questions for you today. So welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation. I, I enjoyed our podcast uh, when you were on the Wellness Paradox, and this is going to be every bit as much fun. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, Mike. Um, speaking of um, the industry, right, you talk about the industry of um, fitness professionals. So tell us, the layman, <laughs> what is the industry of fitness professionals? Who are the fitness professionals? First and foremost, who you are as a fitness professional? You um, encompass so many things in your profession. You started as a trained uh, kinesiologist, and now you are a business owner. You are a lecturer. You are, uh, I guess, an author. You are a podcast host. How did you get there? And who are fitness professionals? How do they fit into this uh, mold? of medicine and this whole thing of wellness. Yeah, that's a, that's a great starting point. And, and so I, I will probably navigate my story a little less, at least to start to answer your question and answer your question more broadly. So when I think of fitness professionals or exercise professionals, I almost break them down into to two categories of people. Um, kind of category number one, I would call um, kind of the hobbyist fitness professional, someone who loves to exercise themselves, you know, someone who, because of that, wanted to get a job in a commercial fitness center, like a Lifetime Fitness or an LA Fitness. And you know, they are there to, in a lot of cases, help the already fit people that go to the standard commercial fitness clubs, help them get a little bit more 
physically fit. So that that's one type of fitness professional, and, and I consider that more of a more of a, of a hobbyist almost than an actual fitness professional or exercise professional. When I think in terms of of the exercise and fitness professional, particularly that the medical field wants to interact with, this is someone that does this for their career. They are somebody who has an academic background in kinesiology, exercise science, exercise physiology. They've gone through that rigorous academic curriculum. And then they've also gone on to get advanced certifications. Um, mm -hmm. So just to kind of make this analogous to the, the medical field, you go to medical school to get your schooling, and then you, you sit for your, your board examination at some point. Well, right. in, in our field, the way we think of that is the American College of Sport Medicine has their exercise physiologist and clinical exercise physiologist credentials. So the exercise professionals that my podcast speaks to, the exercise professionals that I hire in my organization, and I think the exercise professionals that the healthcare community most wants to interact with are those professionals that have a degree and have an advanced certification from the American College of Sport Medicine. That, that, that's how I frame up uh, this space, particularly in the context of the audience that's likely listening to your podcast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where do you go to school to get a certified <laughs> exercise professional or fitness well, professional? Yeah, so this is that this you bring up a really, really good question with this. So our profession academically right now is mm -hmm. undergoing a very much needed transition. So there are many, many schools uh, that offer exercise science curriculums. One of the problems that we've faced over the years is there's not been a lot of standardization in those curricula. So as an example, if, if you uh, went and had my classes at University of Michigan that my colleagues teach, and you went to Michigan State University, which is an, an hour away from us in Ann Arbor, mm -hmm. they have a kinesiology program, but the curriculum is slightly different. And, and you could say that about all the academic curriculums around the country. So one of the things that we are doing as, a, as an academic uh, field is that we are developing programmatic accreditation standards that will ensure that there's consistency in curriculum from institution to institution. So as of right now, uh, by 2027, in order for um, a, a student to sit for an American College of Sport Medicine certification, they will have to be accredited through KHAP, which is the association that accredits allied health programs, for a program in exercise science. So mm -hmm. we, we are growing up as an as a academic field at this point. Um, I would say that probably one of the best ways for your listeners to distinguish if somebody does have the requisite knowledge, skills, and abilities um, at this point prior to this accreditation process being more widespread is if they do have a degree from an institution and they have passed that American College of Sport Medicine either exercise physiologist credential or clinical exercise physiologist credential, that's a pretty good way of knowing that exercise professional has had the proper undergraduate education to be able to uh, work with a population that has more chronic diseases and disabilities. So the key word is exercise physiology. I, I, yes, yes. I think that is that is the word, the exercise, what you, what a, an exercise professional that would work with healthcare truly is, is an exercise physiologist. I think we're used to in healthcare, an exercise physiologist being someone that works with an individual only in cardiac rehab, right? It's someone who's, right. who's had a heart attack, had a stroke, you know, they're, they're in, you know, the different phases of cardiac rehab. Mm -hmm. Where our profession is going and, you know, what my business does is, you know, we hire exercise physiologists that work with people that are post-cardiac rehab, post-physical therapy, that have chronic diseases, disabilities, cardiometabolic diseases. That, that's really ultimately uh, what I have seen uh, success in exercise professionals working in healthcare is they are people who are uh, credentialed exercise physiologists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this is where I want to structure our conversation uh, you know, around this, this specific topic, going beyond um, cardiac rehab mm -hmm. and working with patients with chronic disease, right? Mm -hmm. So 
I am. Uh, uh, let, let's talk about the community doctors. Let's talk about the doctors who have no idea how to refer, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you two case scenarios and let you decide how those doctors should act, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to position myself into those doctors' shoes mm -hmm. and you tell me how to act, who to right. refer to, and right. what resources exist for me. So, mm -hmm. One practical case scenario, I'm a community family physician who has a whole bunch of chronic disease patients, diabetes, hypertension, congestive heart failure. I am practicing in a very small group. I have two nurse practitioners, no exercise facility on site, mm -hmm. and I have no idea how to refer, and I don't know how to write exercise prescriptions, right? But I have 2,000 patients with potential referrals, right? The second case scenario, I am a board certified lifestyle medicine physician and a cardiologist like myself, mm -hmm. but I am in a solo practice or maybe in a very small practice, lifestyle medicine geared practice. I know how to write exercise prescriptions, mm -hmm. but I don't have exercise physiologists on site mm -hmm. and I don't know where to refer, but I have patients who can benefit and and I, I don't know where to refer. So in in case scenario one and two, what do we do? Yeah, and those those are very common scenarios. The good news is that I don't know if if the the path is is different for those two scenarios at, at the end of the day. Certainly in scenario number two, where the, the 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 physician has more experience with exercise prescription, I think that's going to help better inform the referral. But really, what we're asking for here is what's the easiest pathway to find these professionals in your community. And the good news is, is that as part of the ongoing professionalization effort in our field, we have developed some resources. And the resource I would point all the listeners to, and hopefully you can link up to this in your show notes page, is um, the Coalition for the Registry of Exercise Professionals, uh, or CREP for short. Coalition, Coalition Register of Exercise Professionals. Okay. Exactly. And so this, this is a group. Um, and, and the website is usreps.org, usreps.org. And on this website are all of the registered exercise professionals in the country that have passed certifications from specific certifying bodies um, in the exercise profession. Now, it's not just the ACSM that I mentioned earlier. It's also the National Strength and Conditioning Association, the National Council on Strength and Fitness. So there's, there's a handful of organizations that sit underneath this, but any physician can go to usreps.org and they can look up in their area the exercise professionals that are on this registry. And if they're on this registry, you know three things. One, you know that they have received a certification through one of these certifying bodies, and it actually uh, articulates which one they received it through. Mm -hmm. You know if they're current. So just like as a medical professional, you're required a certain number of CMEs, we're required a certain number of continuing education credits uh, to maintain our credential. So the registry is up to date with people who are maintaining their credential. And then it's also a way for us to you know, kick out bad actors from our field if they don't meet ethical uh, and professional standards. So hmm. the, the registry is really the, the go-to place for finding out the professional's you have in your community, but but I will say that it is just the first step because you know this as well as I do, and so do your listeners. Just because you you get through an academic curriculum and, and you pass an exam doesn't necessarily mean that you're as highly qualified as maybe what a provider might want. So ultimately, I think step one is find them on the registry. Step two is you know, do your homework and, and find out a little bit about that exercise professional to ensure that they can meet the needs of your specific patient population. Of course, of course. Now, I can tell you, Mike, um, the most seasoned professionals in our field, you know, they aren't aware or may not be aware of that registry. What do you guys do <laughs> on your part to make us aware of that? 
<laughs> yes, and I would say that probably the majority of people uh, in your field don't know about the registry. And the exercise professional field, I, I kind of- I'm like, not pointing fingers. <laughs> no, 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 you, you, you should be actually, because we should be pointing fingers at ourselves. We are in, uh, I would say we're coming out of our difficult teenage years. Uh, we're, we're starting to grow up as a profession and we're starting to realize that all of these uh, professionalization uh, standards that other fields have had, mm -hmm. we now need to have in our field because there hasn't really been any standardization in the right. exercise profession um, for its entirety of its existence. So right. you know, one of the things that CREP is doing is now they actually do have a, a marketing organization that is behind them that is trying to push out information about the registry. Some of it is through formal social media marketing. A lot of it is people like me who are a part of the organization that advocate for it. Uh, the Physical Activity Alliance is another group that is doing a tremendous amount of work in, mm -hmm. in this professionalization effort. Uh, the Physical Activity Alliance is the nation's largest group of physical activity stakeholders that focus on policy and systems change work. So some of the work that they're doing right now is on the EHR piece to integrate mm -hmm. in the physical activity vital sign into all electronic health records nationally. Right, and right. Then to help put in place um, through the technological medium, a database that would allow for more efficient physician referral that could leverage the registry and other resources. So right now, unfortunately, I think it is a very um, manually labor intensive process for a physician to find an exercise professional in, the, in their community to refer out to. Hopefully within the next five to 10 years with the work that CREP is doing, with the work that the Physical Activity Alliance is doing, uh, this will be something that just gets embedded inside of the electronic health records, just like mm -hmm. any other referral a physician would make. Right. As you pointed out, they, to make it, uh, you know, like the one of the vital signs and just just put it this standardize it across the board would be real helpful. Yeah, um, Mike, uh, going back to the basics. What is the evidence base behind exercise in the reversal of chronic disease? Make the case. <laughs> yes. Well, so I, I, I will make the case, but I'll make it with this caveat. I actually think that at this point, we don't need to convince anybody that exercise works, but I will make the case that it does work. I think what we need to do as a profession is we need to make sure that exercise works for the people that need to do it the most, because the okay. challenge is not exercise working. The challenge is getting the people that don't do it to do it for long enough for it to actually make a, a significant impact on their health. But but okay. I will ask, I will answer your question. I think back to two Stephen Blair studies, one that was done in the late 80s, another one that's done in the early 90s. Stephen Blair, uh, preeminent researcher in our field, sadly just passed away, but left an amazing legacy in our field. And there are two studies that I think of that really point to the role that exercise plays in mitigating chronic disease and improving longevity. One was a study where Blair and colleagues looked at the effect of certain lifestyle factors on uh, prediction of mortality, risk of mortality. And they found that when they looked at low aerobic fitness, cigarette smoking, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high BMI, the biggest predictive factor of all-cause mortality was low aerobic fitness. It was actually a bigger predictor of mortality mm -hmm. than cigarette smoking was. So, I mean, I think that that is a very, very telling piece of research that shows you that you know, we know how bad it is to smoke cigarettes. Like no, no one is walking around nowadays um, thinking that, you know, there's any sort of even a, a modest, you know, moderate health benefit to cigarette smoking and that it wouldn't be really bad for you. Yet we don't have that same view of physical inactivity and low aerobic fitness. And and that's just not something Blair found. I mean, that's been shown in study after study that, you know, low, low fitness, have it be muscular fitness or aerobic fitness, very predictive of mortality and disease. The other study that was done by Blair, and this is probably one of my favorite studies that has ever been done because if the study looked at the impact of different levels of aerobic fitness on mortality. And what it found was when you go from the lowest level of aerobic fitness to the second lowest level of aerobic fitness, your mortality rate is reduced in half. And then you see smaller incremental reductions in mortality over time. 
And the reason I think that that's such an important study and is probably the most important public health message around physical activity that we don't talk about is that we're not saying you need to go from really out of shape to really in shape to reduce your mortality and improve your health. You basically have to go from really out of shape to just a little less really out of shape and you could see a 50% reduction in your mortality. So the way I frame it up is like this, you don't need to go from zero minutes to 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity every week. The most important jump you can make is from zero minutes to mm -hmm. 20 minutes. Like that's way more just, to, to just get, get off the couch. <laughs> and, and, and that is where you see the biggest improvements in health. So uh -huh. those, are the, those are the two big studies that I like to point to. Certainly we've seen recent research come out that's looked more at muscular fitness. Uh, there was a, a major uh, epidemiological study that used hand grip strength as a predictor of all cause mortality. And that study, which was published, yeah, I want to say four or five years ago, found that hand grip strength was a bigger predictor of all cause and cardiovascular mortality than even was blood pressure levels. So, I mean, we have all of these markers that show us the evidence base for the health enhancing benefits of exercise are tremendous. I think the challenge that we face as just an allied health community and a medical community as a whole is not convincing people that it works. It's getting the people that need to do it to do it for long enough for it mm -hmm. to actually make a difference in their life. Right, right. Mike, here's the question, maybe a little bit provocative. <laughs> not sure, but um, still, um, well, if, if I say to my patient who never exercised, right, never exercised, um, instead of exercising with a fitness professional, I will give you behavioral coaching and motivational interviewing every time I see you. I will teach you elementary floor exercises with body weight and tell you to start walking around the block, you know, two minutes a day, like three minutes a day, build it up to 20 minutes a day, et cetera, et cetera, up to 150 <laughs> minutes per week or whatever, 75 minutes per So. Would that be beneficial? Do we need fitness professionals for that? I, I don't actually think it's a controversial question. I think it's an important question. I would say for a lot of people out there who maybe aren't going to run to a gym or a fitness center and buy a membership right away because that's just a bridge too far for them, I think that's a great starting point. I think for other people, they, they may need the guidance and the structure of a professional. So yeah, I think of somebody who's a patient who, you know, maybe they don't have, maybe they don't have any significant um, disease or disability, um, or maybe they do, but it's really, really stable. It's been treated by medications for years and, and it's a stable condition. I think that person, if what you just said resonates with that person and they think it's feasible for them to do, I think that's a great starting point. I think for other people, maybe somebody who has, um, maybe it's a newer you know, disease or disability, or it, it's a little bit unstable, they might need the, the confidence in having a professional by their side to ensure that the things they're doing don't make their condition any worse. So I think broadly speaking, the way we need to think about physical activity and exercise prescription is it's a continuum. People should be starting with physical activity, which is what I would say you just laid out in, in your scenario there. And, and then they can move to exercise in a more formal sense when they become more comfortable with physical activity. The real question will be, does that individual patient feel like they need the guidance and the oversight of a professional to do it safely? If they do, then I think the referral is important. If, if they don't, um, and they can maintain a degree of compliance with what you laid out, then I think that's a perfect plan. It's a, that what you just kind of said is kind of crawl, walk, run, right? Like start with something that they could simply do. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, so, so yeah, I, I am all for that. And I think becoming an exerciser starts with being physically active. Being somebody who is physically active, that starts with somebody who's less sedentary. So, you know, like when I think of this hierarchy, the first thing I tell people to do is, you know, kind of like move more and sit a little less, right? And then I right. talk about physical activity and then I talk about exercise. And so I, I'm great with kind of that hierarchy of eventually getting them to exercise, realizing that the vast majority of people aren't going to jump from nothing to exercise right off the bat. Right, right. Mike, around the world, I travel a lot and around the world, people are getting bigger. 
I noticed that in all countries across the board, people are getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Food industry is, in my opinion, doing very little to help. We are struggling. And when people see the choices of exercise versus Ozempic or Govia, whatever, um, they may go for straight for Ozempic. They, they need to lose 5% of their body weight to qualify. Um, you know, they have to be above 35% BMI to qualify for Ozempic or related, you know, medications. But people may choose weight loss drugs right and the practices that um, um geared to that are popping up everywhere right weight loss weight loss weight loss uh, physicians weight loss medications etc so how can we make a compelling case to patients hey number one we don't know long-term side effects of those medications two you may not be able or we don't know take it you know for life um at some point you may not be able to you know take it or you will have to you will you will have to take those medications taper them off right and continue <laughs> lifestyle lifestyle interventions um to to maintain your weight loss so you have to exercise for all the benefits across the board you just mentioned so tell me what are the behavioral interventions what do you tell your patients yeah, well, you, I mean, you bring up such an interesting point, and certainly it, it's this is a conversation that is you obvious. have to exercise, you have yeah. to exercise. So, so I think it really starts with the messaging around exercise and what it is intended for and, and what it isn't. I think we've conflated um, exercise with weight loss for, for far too long, and we know based upon the research that at best, exercise alone results in, you know, maybe two and a half, three, four percent weight loss. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's very modest. You add a good dietary intervention and then you see much more significant weight loss. Uh, no doubt, you know, the, the anti-obesity medications are causing ridiculous amounts of weight loss, uh, more than what we probably would have ever expected. And you are right. We don't know the long-term effects, but what I think this gives at least the physical activity and exercise community a chance to do is say, okay, you know, clearly right now, if we're going to message that the reason you're supposed to exercise is because you're going to lose weight, we're going to lose that messaging battle all day long because, you know, the pharma companies have something that is, is much more effective and much easier. So this is where I think our messaging needs to really focus on all of the other benefits that you get from exercise. So certainly the physical benefits, but where I think we really have a great opportunity with messaging exercise and physical activity interventions is around the mental health benefit. Okay. Um, the, the reality is, is that the physical health benefits of exercise take a while to manifest themselves. Like, you know, you don't lower your A1C after just exercising for two hours, right? But I know this, and you know this, and so do your listeners. If you work out or you go for a walk or you do some sort of physical activity, you immediately feel better psychologically afterwards. So I think that this gives us a, an opportunity right now to say, okay, let, let's recalibrate our messaging around physical activity and exercise. Let's emphasize the mental health benefits of it. Let's emphasize the, the health benefits that are not weight related in nature. Let's emphasize the the muscle strengthening and the muscle maintenance aspect of you know, being able to be on a properly prescribed strength training program. You know, when I think of the, the anti-obesity medications and the space that you know, exercise professionals have in, in their prescription, we know that there's huge amounts of lean mass lost when people are on these medications. Now, at this point, the research isn't really clear if that's actually muscle mass predominantly or what, what it might be, but mm -hmm. certainly large amounts of muscle mass are being lost. So again, I think it's just reframing the message for so long, exercise and physical activity have been tethered to body weight and body composition that I think it is just really... It, it's it's really conflated what exercise is meant for, which is for the body to function better, not right. necessarily for the body to look a different way. Right, right. No, totally. Um, you you said it to function better and mental health. You know, I am a big big uh, fan of mental health. You know, cardio seats is all for mental health, especially mental health professionals. Uh, I gear my programs to mental health professionals. So let's talk about the benefits of exercise 
uh, for mental health and uh, specifically maybe you can mention how we can benefit our healthcare professionals and their mental health with your programs perhaps what you do or what you can do and other fitness professionals can do for our healthcare professionals yeah absolutely and like make no mistake about it i think most of the listeners will know just uh, from the research that I mean, exercise interventions in a lot of cases have been shown to be as effective as some of the you know, the psychotropic drugs for uh -huh. depression, anxiety, all those yeah. things. So, you know, I, I think particularly for the healthcare professionals that are working, they're listening, and I realize that schedules are crazy and pressures are high. And so I think it's a matter of, you know, doing, being realistic with what you can do at any given point in time in your life. And I think when I think of a work day, you know, for any professional, I always think, okay, where are there the ability to add, you know, little exercise snacks in, you know, throughout your work day? I mean, if you're, I don't know, a busy ER physician in some massive, you know, urban hospital, you, you work in a 24-hour a shift, you're probably not going to be able to run down to the local Planet Fitness and get a workout in. But <laughs> could, could you, could you, do, could you do body weight exercises? Could you do squats and wall push-ups and use a resistance band? Are there ways to, you know, break that up into, you know, 10 five-minute bouts throughout your day? I think. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the things we know from a lot of research, and fortunately we've got away from this, is we used to think, okay, if you don't do a minimum of 30 minutes, this goes back to the old, old guidelines for physical activity, that like if you didn't hit 30 minutes, it wasn't beneficial. Well, now we know everything counts. And so, you know, if I'm if I'm somebody who's leading a, a busy, hectic day, you know, if you know the first quarter of my day, I say, you know, my goal is to get in, you know. 40 body weight squats in the first three hours of my day, no matter how I break it up. And then, you know, the next, you know, three hours or whatever it is, I'm going to find a resistance band and I'm going to try to get in 40 back rows during that period of time. I think it is just kind of shrinking the expectation around, you know, what a, a workout actually means. And it doesn't mean you've got to get it in one solid block in a fitness center with mirrors and music and all those things, it can be broken up throughout the course of the day. And certainly, and this is, is always my plea, particularly for those professionals, I know with telehealth now, you know, people are spending so much time in front of their computers. If you could figure out a way to sit for no longer than you know 60 to 90 minutes and then get up and move for three, four, five minutes, we know that can have a profound impact on cardiometabolic health. And you also improve your mental clarity as well. So I think, you know, for anyone in the medical profession that is looking to lead a more physically active lifestyle, I think it's just reframing what it means to get in your physical activity and your exercise into something that's broken up into manageable bouts during your day. Hmm. Such a perfect way. Listen, people. <laughs> Listen to the professional. <laughs> Mike, um, last year in your episode 86 of your Wellness Paradox podcast, you were talking about your predictions um, for the the trends that you, you thought about the wellness industry would go this year, this year, 2023. How did it pan out? How did your predictions oh. <laughs> pan out this year? And what do you think? Or the industry go in next year? Where 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 do you think it's going? Yeah, so this is, you this, were you were you were talking about the um, the shortage of um, wellness professionals. One thing about telemedicine, going telemedicine, bridging between the mainstream medicine and your um, you know your field um, about other you know um, other challenges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So mainly about the challenges and the credentials and all of those things that were. Um, and the predictions for this year. So you're, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, you're, you remember? <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, 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 I remember. Now I'm just, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to benchmark it a little bit. Yeah, I would say that you, know, I, systematic progress is so slow. Yes. Uh, and, and I think it's the thing. You know, I'm an entrepreneur um, as well as an exercise professional, and as an entrepreneur, I want to move much, much faster sometimes than what pub public policy you know, will allow for in a lot of cases, but, but I'm heartened with a lot of the work that's going on. So um, I can tell you on, on the policy and systems level, um, I have mentioned them before, the Physical Activity Alliance has done a lot of tremendous work in the past year, um, working with uh, CMS, working with the Department of Health and Human Services, 
uh, working with the Office of the National Coordinator for Interoperability around uh, the physical activity vital sign. So that is something that to not get too in the weeds um, in the next couple of years, that is going to become a requirement in electronic health records. So I think that is a very positive step. Uh, I also know the PA has done some work with the healthcare consultancy Avalier on a payer strategy for how we actually reimburse the exercise service. Uh, mm -hmm. I am the guest editor for a journal of the American College of Sport Medicine on this professionalization and advocacy effort. So although I think that we've only had a handful of tangible wins, what I do see is there's much more conversation that is happening around what we're talking about right here, which is that you know a highly qualified exercise professional can be a significant asset to the healthcare system in this country. The question is just how to get them in there and a part of the standard clinical workflows. And it, it as everyone who's listening to this podcast knows, it's such a complex uh, bureaucracy and there's so much nuance to the, the policy and the systems that it, it's taken a lot of time to put those structures in place. But I feel like we're at the stage where we're really laying the groundwork for it well. I would say this, the need is becomes increasingly greater you know, every single year that goes by as our population becomes less and less physically active and less right. healthy. And so I'm hoping that the, the demand and the supply eventually meet, meet. Under, the, under the umbrella of a system that is able to accommodate it. But right now it is a lot of um, grassroots kind of you know guerrilla marketing tactics <laughs> to, to make this a reality. And, and I think you know that's what I would encourage your listeners to think about is that even though there isn't a system, formal large scale system in place right now, you know, what are things that you can do in your individual practice in terms of connecting with an exercise professional in your community to be able to help you, you know, treat your patient population? Because I know all the medical professionals that are listening to this, mm -hmm. you don't have enough time um, mm -hmm. and you don't get reimbursed for our services, you know, very much, you know, if at all, in some cases. So, you know, how, how can you be part of that grassroots change effort that eventually will be a top-down policy and, and system type of a of a, an approach. But right now it's still requiring people like you and I and, and the listeners to this podcast to actually focus on making this a reality. So uh, to circle back around to answer the question, my predictions are, I think, slowly manifesting themselves. So the predictions in and of themselves, I think are accurate. The time horizon that they may unfold under is probably longer than what I and you and everyone else who's listening want it to be. Right, right. So um, to, uh, to ask, to send a message to healthcare professionals in mainstream medicine that you, you know, you are talking to, you will be listening to our podcast. Um, what are the main chronic diseases that can be affected by your fitness professionals, you know, so what are they thinking, you know, the patients that can be mostly affected by you guys. Yeah, I, I think I've, I've and, always said. I've, and also I've, the second part of that question, what can be done in terms of health, telehealth or, you know, using the um, uh, uh, other tools, virtual tools that can be, you know, linked between them and you guys? Yeah, I, great, great question. I think that, you know, I always say this, I think, you know, if there's any population that can most be helped by what we do, it's the diabetic population. Diabetic. Like, you know, exercise without a doubt, you know, is, I mean, you go back to the, you know, diabetes prevention program, the, the, all the CDC trials, the look ahead, all of those, like exercise is actually like a cure for diabetes. I, you know, I don't know about you, but like, I get frustrated when I hear about Congress talking about how they want to cap the price of insulin. I'm like, well, I know how we can get people off of insulin and there's all <laughs> kinds of other benefits, right? Right, right. So, so I would say the diabetic population, you know, certainly one. A population who's dealing with mental health issues, I think, you know, depression, anxiety, those kind of uh, not, you know, not the debilitating depression and anxiety, but people who have kind of, you know, mild depression and anxiety, the, we can work with those people really. Languishing, languishing. Yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. And, 
And I think, you know, from an orthopedic standpoint, just kind of those, those chronic postural aches and pains that people deal with that can be pretty debilitating. So low back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, you know, those, those are the areas where I, I think we have the broadest ability to make an impact. Look, certainly exercise and physical activity can help address almost any health condition that exists out there. But when I'm thinking of the ones that are highest impact and, and most high mileage, I would say, you know, diabetes, mental health, and then kind of chronic postural aches and pains to include low back and like upper back and neck pain. I think those are, those are some of our go-to areas as a profession. And then right. about how to leverage, you know, the, the, the telehealth that's out there. I think one of the interesting things that's starting to happen is that uh, particularly a lot of the wearables that are out there now provide a lot of really, really good you know, data and reporting around objective physical activity measures. We know that you know, self-report is limited in terms of it, its reliability and its accuracy in some cases. So I think there's a great opportunity there. I think that our field coming out of COVID has really embraced the ability to do telehealth training. So I know here in my business, you know, we actually do have a large number of our of our clients that they don't want to come in here or they can't come in here. And you know, we do their training, you know, over Zoom. So I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity there. Uh, and I think you the limitation to telehealth. Um, in the exercise profession right now is a lot of our devices and a lot of our tools are not HIPAA compliant at this point. They've not gone through that more rigorous process, but they will, you know, over the course of time. And I think that will allow them to be used a little bit more broadly. Uh, but right now, I would say that, you know, we are looking for ways to use kind of the you know, commercially available fitness and activity technology that's out there as a way to be able to better and more effectively monitor the patient and, and client populations we work with. Hmm. Very interesting. What are the emerging technology trends for 2024 for consumers and doctors to be to be looking at in your field? Uh, yeah, I, well, so I, I'm really fascinated, and you're not going to be surprised that I say this, by the role AI will play, you know, in our field going forward. I think you know, our ability to develop uh, slightly more tailored exercise prescriptions and clinical guidelines based upon AI algorithms, I, I think are going to be really, really important. I also think, you know, much like in healthcare, you're starting to see this ambient listening technology that allows for notes from sessions and things like that. I think that that is an emerging technology that will help us from a, a coaching perspective. And then I think, you know, what we're also seeing is some technology platforms that are out there, um, you know, Trainerize is one, Exe is another, these platforms that are designed to be able to deliver the exercise prescription to people more efficiently. Uh, you know, we use, uh, we use a platform in our business that's able to do that. And those are only becoming, you know, more sophisticated. So, you know, I view our technology tools uh, in our field just becoming uh, more refined. I will say this though, and this is the the struggle uh, in our field, since you know the profit margins in fitness are lower than the profit margins in healthcare or a lot of other places. We tend to lag from a technological perspective. So I think you know, we're trying to make up for that lag. Um, and so there's a bit of a trickle down effect. Uh, the last area that I will point out, which I'm really interested in, is is um, what I'll call the smart strength training technology. And this is um, things like Tonal, as an example. People have seen uh, Tonal, which is a, an at-home device. But now you're starting to see some of that technology make its way into commercial fitness equipment. And by smart strength equipment, I mean equipment that is able to better quantify loads, the work that's been done, right, right. better data analytics, and also help provide um, progressions for loads for people when they're lifting to ensure that the load progression is appropriate. So yeah, I think the technology base is definitely starting to expand in our field. Um, I just think you know, whatever, whatever's working in other fields technologically um, today will probably become a reality in our field tomorrow. That's always seems to be how it happens. Hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> and um... A um, couple more questions before we wrap up real quick. Um, if you could go back 10 years, could you do anything different in your life professionally? And if so, why? 
<laughs> Man, uh, <laughs> I don't, if these are quick questions. That's probably not the best one to ask because there'd be so many things. I, I think that the one thing that I would do differently is have a better appreciation for imagery and messaging in, in our field of fitness and exercise. I don't think 10 years ago, I really realized how a lot of the traditional fitness industry messaging and imagery um, didn't resonate with the people that we need to help the most. And what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you overuse the word exercise or fitness, or you talk about weight loss too much, or you know, getting your beach body or whatever those terms are, that that that's very off-putting to a large segment of the population. And I don't think, you know, even though my company didn't use a lot of those terms, I don't think I had real appreciation for you know how deleterious those were to the people that yeah didn't uh engage with our industry and same thing with you know imagery i think you know making sure that we have diversity in terms of body shape sizes you know gender ethnicity in, in our messaging i think that that i think that would be a big thing that i would change and then the second thing i'll add is i would have gotten involved in advocacy uh and policy change much much sooner i mean i've been fortunate enough to do some advocacy and policy work here in the state of Michigan that has really <laughs> led to um, some significant uh, results. I've been able to do that in the national level as well through the Physical Activity Alliance and through URSA. And you know, I thought that I didn't do politics. And then, <laughs> I realized, then I realized that if you're in business, you're in politics. And I think I have I really came to enjoy the advocacy piece. Mm. How interesting. If you're in business, you're in politics, <laughs> Michael Stack. <laughs> so this holiday season, the last the last question, this holiday season, what message would you send to our patients and our professionals, both healthcare professionals and fitness professionals? I would say I'll use the the analogy of, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first. Ah. I think I think that in a lot of cases, particularly this time of year, there's so much about trying to give to other people, which is a, a very, very worthwhile thing. But I think the realization that you know, unless you take care of yourself, you can't take care of others, I think is something that is so, so, so important. So that, that'd be the message I would leave people with. Is, you know, make, <laughs> make sure you are taking care of yourself and, and putting your own needs high up there because you need a full tank to be able to help to give to others. So put your own oxygen mask on first. Well, listen, people, put your, your own oxygen mask on first and then help your children. <laughs> well, Michael Stack, thank you so very much for your time and for your invaluable insights and the conversation today. I personally learned a whole lot from you today, and I hope that our listeners and viewers did the same. Thank you. And thank you so much for everybody to be here today to listen and tune in to our podcast and for everybody who can give the gift of uh, to, you know, wellness and health to our resident physicians and to all female physicians in their mid career and early career, please um, give the gift the resident physicians. This is our new book, Resilience in Scrubs, uh, available on Amazon, and it's packed with valuable resources on wellness and health, as well as career developments. So please, um, all the proceeds will be given back to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And thank you for listening. It was your host, Dr. Svetlana Shimon, and we will see you back on the next episode of the Cardio Seeds podcast. Thank you. Mike, thank you again. See you next. Bye-bye. Awesome. That was great. Good job. Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. I, I, I will talk to you later then. Yeah, absolutely. And then I'm going to connect you with my social media person as well. Uh, so she'll help promote this podcast on our side too. That would be great. <laughs> talk yeah, later. Bye. Have a great holiday season, Mike. Yep, you too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.